episode 167. Efficiency, I think, is the true key. So we were constantly looking to improve efficiency, whether it's buying extra equipment so technicians didn't have to walk as far, um, using digital inspections, using technology to our advantage to build work orders faster, to have the process quicker, much as we can out of the location in three bays. Welcome, aftermarketers, to Remarkable Result Radio. Listen to learn just one thing from today's episode on your journey to remarkable results. Hello, aftermarketers throughout North America and around the world. Carm Capriato here, and thank you for listening. And welcome to episode 167 with Eric Svedberg from Automotive Specialties. This episode is brought to you by Federal Mogul Motor Parts. They are the reason you enjoy these interviews twice per week. When you need innovation and quality, you need Federal Mogul Motor Parts. With brands like Moog, Felpro, Wagner Brake, Champion, Seal Power, FP Diesel, and more. They're the parts, Tex Trust. Find out more at fmmotorparts.com. One big takeaway from Apex 2016 in Las Vegas was that baby boomers do not know what podcasts are. And I need your help. Every aftermarket player who does appreciate and understand the value of podcasts, and especially this one, hey, can you please pay it forward and find someone who does not understand what a podcast is? Looks like the only way the established members of our aftermarket are going to be engaged in the premier podcast of aftermarket professionals is to be shown how to podcast, actually how to listen. Show them that they can listen on my website or on apps like Apple iTunes, Google Play Music, Spreaker, and Stitcher Radio. I'll need to keep this dialogue alive as there are hundreds of thousands of aftermarket professionals that do not know what a podcast is. That continues to be the biggest challenge and yet the biggest opportunity. And thanks for your help. Now meet Eric Svedberg. He knows what podcasts are because he's a fan. Eric is a young entrepreneur. In fact, his only job ever has been an Amco dealer and then shop owner. He started in his early 20s, and he's now 45 years old. He's a seasoned veteran of the industry. Eric brings his viewpoints to bear in this episode. He has branded himself as a dealer alternative ever since he started in business. He's got insights to share with you on how he bonuses his techs for ASC certifications, how he uses his digital vehicle inspection software, and why he values historical transaction data in his inspection process. He tells why he values Vision High Tech Training and Expo, what he does to recharge. He also speaks to the tech shortage and what it took for him to learn the business and so much more. Find additional show notes on my website, remarkableresults.biz slash E167. Here's a bright and energetic service professional that knows exactly where he's going and how he's getting there. Enjoy the stories. Now, Eric Svedberg. Today, meet the owner of Automotive Specialists in Virginia Beach, Virginia. With three techs, three bays, and three lifts at his shop, he specializes in Asian and domestic, is a member of IATN, and an AC Delco Professional Service Center. My guest is an ASE Master Tech and partners with Family Service Day for Philanthropy, and he works with Jeremy O'Neill of, of Advisor Fix for Training. Hey, everyone, please welcome Eric Speedberg. Hey there. Hey, are you ready to share your remarkable results? I am. All right. Glad to have you here. Virginia Beach. Being a Northeasterner like I am, of course, we see commercials for Virginia Beach all the time. Big transient community with tourists? We get quite a few tourists. It's a tourist destination since uh, there's a lot of beach and a lot of activities. You like living there? Yeah, because I actually live at the beach, so that's nice. So when did you realize you were living the good life? Probably when I was 22 years old when I bought the business. <laughs> Big move. Hey, I'd love to find out about that. Yes, we will. We'll figure that out. You have a tagline on your website that says Automotive Specialists is the dealer alternative. How long have, yes. you, how long have you used that? Well, I started off as an Amoco dealer. And when I uh, got rid of gas and got out of the service station industry and went strictly on of repair. Um, wanted to come up with a good logo and a good slogan 
And I thought of myself as the dealer alternative because um, I didn't feel like my clientele had to go to the dealer for everything. Um, they could come to me for, you know, all sorts of things that they felt in the past they only could go to the dealer. So were you? You were using that slogan, I think, way before it was ever possible. There's a lot of uh, a lot of shops using it today. Yes, yes. We tried to stay ahead of the curve. Has that guided many of the things that uh, and the decisions you've you've made along the way? Uh, for sure. Especially we use it for marketing. So um, since we specialize in Asian domestic, um, it allows us to have a lot of tooling. Um, that maybe other shops might not have. So, you know, we have factory scan tools for everything we work on, at least 90% of what we work on. Um, and so we use that to differentiate ourselves from other shops. What's the latest update or a piece of equipment you bought to help you in that realm? It's usually just adding one factory scan tool at a time until we had them all. Um, you know, each one is you know, thousands of dollars. So it's cost prohibitive to, you know, maybe go out and do it all at one time. But, you know, we would start with GM, then we added Ford, then we added Chrysler, Honda, Toyota, and just went down the list. So uh, we had them all. So um, that's made it really nice. Okay. Anything else that you may have purchased recently to help? Um, what we try and do is if there's a specific mechanical tool um, we're always looking for them. So if, you know, we specialize in, you know, Asian domestic and there's a certain tool for Toyota that makes a timing belt faster, easier, we want to make sure we have that tool. In our pre-call, you were um, very, uh, let me let me say, uh, adamant about the fact that, you know, you've got a three-bay place that you continue to grow each and every year. You kind of almost defy the laws of gravity, and you were very proud of how you were getting all that done. Carm, we've grown every year, and I'm still holding my margins. You were proud as a peacock. How you get? <laughs> how you getting that done? Well, I am a numbers guy, so I, I'm always looking at numbers. All right. Um, that's number one. Number two, uh, efficiency, I think, is the true key. So we were constantly looking to improve efficiency, whether it's buying extra equipment so technicians didn't have to walk as far, um, using digital inspections, using technology to our advantage to build work orders faster, to have the process quicker, um, to get as much as we can out of the location in three bays. What about training to, to keep you guys ahead of that curve? We love vision, so I actually uh, close my shop down and take my whole crew to vision every year. We're going, I already bought the airline tickets for this year um, or next year's vision. Uh, I have a bonus structure so that each quarter, if they show me that they had 12 hours of ongoing training um, for that quarter, that their entire next quarter, each week, they get a bonus. So... Uh, that's been great. Um, 48 hours a year is what you're asking your techs to get. On their own. On, on their own. On their own. You know? So okay. um, we we have a saying at my shop, um, if you're not working, you're cleaning. If you're not cleaning, you're training. So um, we're only open five days a week. So we're go, go, go five days a week. And we enjoy our weekends off. So if we're not working and we have that, you know, one day, two day period, you know, maybe near Christmas or something like that. You know, we're definitely going to do some training between the techs, bring a car in, hook up our latest equipment, you know, simulate some, you know, breaking cars, something like that. You know, there's nothing wrong with play. You know, play is a is a pretty strategic um, business move to because uh, there's a lot of learning when you're playing. I agree. You've always counted on Moog to keep you ahead of the pack when it comes to chassis innovation. Well, they've done it again. Most recently launched is the Moog ball joint with a pre-installed integral dust boot. It's designed exclusively for compression-loaded suspension systems, providing superior strength and durability for these types of vehicle applications. The dust boot is made from higher strength materials and comes pre-installed, saving you time because it's easier to install. It also has a larger contact area against the stud, which makes a more effective seal. 
For your customers, the unit uses Moog's powdered metal gusher bearing that provides longer life and controlled radial and axial movement. You get the industry's leading coverage of 10,000 SKUs, including 4,600 for foreign applications. Hey, you've been installing Moog confidently for years, and now you know why. So, saving steps. Uh, I think that was one of the things you said to become efficient. I'm assuming you've got the, uh, your, are you a paperless office? Tell me about your SMS and your digital vehicle inspection program. We're not 100% paperless. Uh, we haven't gone there yet because we felt like we mo- might lose a little bit too much. You know, for instance, if they have to write down some stuff they put on a car, um, sometimes that's difficult if you're totally paperless. Um, you lose a few items you put on a car, you know, O-rings, you know, what have you, bolts, and that adds up to thousands of dollars a year right. if you don't get out the RO. Um, as far as the digital inspections, we use bolt-on technology. The guys have that down pat, and we also use um, service intelligence for our service history so that with just a couple clicks, they can see everything that we've done to the vehicle and what we haven't done to the vehicle yet as far as maintenance needs. Um, when we join those two with pictures and actually have the technicians with bolt-on um, setting up the uh, can jobs, um, and it's a lot of work in the beginning, but it pays dividends as you go. Um, it actually builds, I would say, 80, if not 90% of the work order already for the uh, service advisor. Right. So, you know, they might throw in some parts here or there. They might fine tune it a little bit. They might actually have to do the valve cover gas gas in there or something like that, where most of the maintenance ones are, are pre done with can jobs. And then uh, we send it off via email or text, and, you know, Anywhere between five seconds and five minutes later, we usually get a phone call. Isn't it amazing? I, I did an interview yesterday that said, um, and, it, and it hasn't been released yet, about the digital sales process. 98% of texts are read versus 20% of emails. Would you agree? I would totally agree. The most important part of the digital process, I think, is the pictures. You really can't argue with a picture. So you know, it, it makes it much easier for the service advisor. That's that's great. I'm glad you've made that huge leap. Now, uh, I haven't heard anyone ever talk about service history yet. Explain to me why that brings value during the inspection process. For quite a few reasons. Um, if we have a vehicle that we've worked on, you know, for quite a while and they've been a regular <laughs> customer, we, we see a lot of service history. And like I said, we use service intelligence for that. And so with one click, um, from our Mitchell program, you pull that up and you can see we did the air filter at this time. We did front struts at this time. We checked the brakes last this time. So therefore, things don't get by you. Does it allow you to do a more efficient inspection in the beginning? Hey, we just we just did this last time. I may not want to pull a wheel. Is that is that what you're saying? For sure, depending on what we're doing. Um, there's no need to go check an air filter if service history uh, or service intelligence shows you did it, you know, two oil changes ago. Um, so if you multiply that times 20 line items, it makes it quite quick. So usually when the guys pull a car into the shop and they grab the mileage, pop the hood, they go straight to the computer, enter the mileage, and they're, they have their tablet in front of them, and they're looking at service intelligence for that history first – And so things that might show up black, which means we've never serviced that item, or things that show up red, that means, hey, there's a strong possibility this needs to be done again. Um, You know, they're aware of it and adding those notes to their inspection process. But is is that red flag based on a predicted miles driven? That is based on our um, input to the program of what we wanted to say. So an easy one would be, Um, batteries. We flag batteries at 48 months, so four years. So we're putting in five-year batteries. I think, you know, depending on where you live in the country, not all batteries can go five years. So Mm -hmm. if it shows up red, we know it's been at least four years since that battery was installed. And we can forewarn the customer that, hey, before you come out and your car doesn't start one day, you might want to think about putting another battery in. You know, hearing you talk, is it possible that there aren't enough shop owners that own software that use their software to their max capacity or or availability. 
you do you dig in and say, hey, I, I want to see everything that, that this software does and, and use it to its max? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of techie. My shop's kind of techie. So, yeah, when when we get some new software, if we have service intelligence, I'm looking at everything that program can do. I would say if this fits for my business, I'm using it. If it is going to slow us down or we um, have something else that does the same thing, then we will pick the best of both worlds. There's a lot of shops that uh, don't use the uh, as much software and technology that you're using. How were the techs in adapting to, you know, hanging out with a tablet and, and that discipline? Um, there definitely has to be some buy-in, um, but also the shop is not a democracy. So um, if we're going for tablets and we're going for digital inspections, um, we're going for tablets and digital inspections. I, yeah. I get it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so there's training. Um, maybe there would be, you know, a month of practice. Um, there would be, we try and have a team environment. So maybe other techs would help a tech that's not fully on board. Um, but they all came around. To, uh, I got some young guys. They're, they're, uh, they're pretty techy themselves. So they enjoy it. Have you ever grown a tech, you know, brought in a B, a C or a B and, and made him an A? Yeah, I have a tech named Rex. He had just wanted to go work at a dealership. I had met his sister. She's an x-ray tech. I was having my knee looked at. I was looking for someone. She told me about her brother. I talked to him. He was a great guy. And I had he had just put in his application at the dealership, I think, you know, a week. And... I'm like, hey, and they were hiring them. And I said, no, you really want to come work for me. So, you know, I convinced them to come work for me. And I grew him from um, just, you know, a lube tech to a state inspector to a full-blown tech. And, you know, in about two years, um, of course, he's still kind of green, but he's got such a positive attitude. Um, He's just really a great guy and the customers love him. Is he starting to get his ASEs? Uh, that's next on his agenda because we have a bonus program. Once you hit four ASCs, we give you, you know, a bonus every single week in your check. And if you hit master tech, we give you a different bonus. Okay. So you're not a democracy, but it seems like you have an incredible culture. Uh, we try, you know, I'm, I'm kind of hard to work for a little bit because I demand so much. And when I say I demand a lot, it's really for their benefit. I want my guys to do a great job. I want them to constantly learn. I want them to be the best in the industry. I want them to be the professional. I don't accept anything much less than that. So you are unemployable. <laughs> Myself? Yes. Um, I guess you could say that. Uh, so you, you, you know, I kind of, I kind of heard that inside of you, you know, you demand this now. Sure. You could probably go out and, and work for someone, but you're probably more comfortable being an entrepreneur. Uh, for sure. Probably since I've done it from such a young age, um, I don't know anything else almost. So, you know, that is, uh, you know, there's a lot of guys that have teched for, you know, 10 12 years and then decided to get their first place. Now, when you opened up, what did you know about business? Not much, but I was really good at math and numbers in school. That was my thing. Um, And when I became an Amoco dealer, um, I think it's pretty good when you start with that foundation because you're required to go to Amoco school in Chicago for a couple weeks. Um, and they teach you a lot of numbers. They teach you, you know, pool margins. And they really started me off on the right track. And I took that and grew from there. So how about finance and HR and marketing? Did you learn that from a business coach, a mentor? I guess I'm just really stubborn because I just figured it all out on my own. You know, threw things against the wall to see what stuck and did my own thing. And I always wanted to be different than the other shops. Um, so sometimes that was good. Sometimes that was bad. I would say, you know, being in business 22 years, it took 12 years at least to really fine tune and get good at what I do. You know, that's not a bad number out of 22 years to, uh, to continue to fine tune. Now I bet you you're still fine tuning every day. Every day we find too. Well, that was the answer I was looking for. What are you spending money on advertising marketing? I try and hit 
um, 5%. We spend the vast majority of our funds on our existing customer base, but I still want my name out there in social media and other places. Um, I think that pays dividends long-term. You, I don't think you see short-term results from that, but you know, long-term you have to have, you know, a vested six months, a year, two years, and just stick with it. Um, to see the results. Facebook, uh, Google, where, where are you putting it? A um, little bit everywhere. We use Kakui, so they're doing some ad words. Um, the app Waz or Waze, which oh, is yeah, uh, sure. a directions app, um, they now allow advertising. So I just started that this month. Interesting. Um, and I just set a budget, and I said, okay, I'll throw some money at this for about a year. Um, it's well within my budget still, and we'll see what that does. They just started advertising. Now, you know who owns Waze or Waz, right? Uh, who? Google. Google. Oh, perfect. I'm almost 100%. Oh, so good. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm almost 100% sure it was Google who bought that. And I had, I had that, I've had that on my phone for probably five years. So, Eric, telematics, the, who owns the data, the driverless autonomous car, hydrogen vehicles, electric vehicles, scare you in any way doesn't really scare me because um since i started doing this in the mid 80s um i found out early on that cars will constantly change and they'll constantly evolve and i guess the good part about being in the aftermarket is we don't really have to concern ourselves too much until a couple years in you know the dealer is taking care of warranty issues. So when a brand new technology comes out and a car has it and it has 5,000 miles and it breaks, they're not coming to the aftermarket to repair that. You know, you can go to places like Vision and have the best trainers and learn about things until it hits your driveway. Yeah, it's amazing. I've always loved a phrase, nature will find a way. And the entrepreneurialism in the aftermarket from the trainers and the equipment makers, I mean, they're studying this stuff for you right now. And to your point, when they start hitting your bays, you'll have all kinds of resources to either learn from or equipment to be able to buy to fix it. You agree with that? I totally agree with that. And there's always that balance, um, you know, say I hadn't seen one yet. So say a hydrogen fuel cell comes in for a repair today, um, there has to be a little bit of a balance between, you know, on the job training and what you're charging that customer. So if it's taking your tech, you know, numerous hours to figure out how something's working, you know, you have to balance that. And that's a business decision for most people. So ride sharing, uh, millennials aren't getting their licenses. Is it going to have an impact? I would think so. Do millennials have money to repair cars anyway? So I'm sure it's going to be an impact on how many cars are on the road, but I uh, have not seen that yet. I guess this might be five to 10 years away as well. You see, I don't see a person like you being ever worried about these challenges because you're going to either stay a step ahead or be able to quickly recover if you didn't meet the challenge. And, you know, consolidation within the industry, boomers retiring and maybe not selling their business. Do you, do you believe that there's going to be enough to go around? Um, I believe so. You know, I don't know what's going to happen 50 years from now. But uh, for the immediate future, there are certainly plenty on, of cars on the road to fix. Um, if it starts to dwindle, you could make changes as you went, but it's not going to be this just fall off the cliff. All right. You're probably going to be around in 50 years to see what you just said right now. Okay. I better write that down. I'm not. <laughs> I know for <laughs> sure I'm not going to be around in 50 years. Now, I may be around in 25 still, but maybe sure. not 50. Are you going to be excited to see what, what this entire world's going to be like i've always been excited about changes in technology and what people can invent um so yeah i, I think it's exciting to see that and to see driverless cars and autonomous cars and see where that takes us and uh um, adapt from there
you know, entrepreneurs are really good at that. I was listening to one of your podcasts uh, earlier in the week, and he was talking about going away from the body shop business. And, you know, I think he had said that's 40 or 50% of his business. So what a change. And so he's going to adapt and he's going to make it work. Yeah, that was John Miller. And John Miller is a, is a boomer, and he shows no signs of quitting. And uh, he, great guy, just just a just a fun guy. And that was a straight up episode. I mean, he didn't pull any punches. No, and if he can if he can make that kind of change, I believe he was age sixty nine, sixty seven. Uh-huh. Very 67. good. I'm a, I'm impressed. You're a very good listener. Yes. Yeah. So if he could make that major change in his business at that age, then I think at my tender age of 45, I can do anything. <laughs> yeah, you'll be, you'll be 95. You'll be in the home. <laughs> they'll, you'll, they say, pull the wheelchair over. I want to watch the news. There's something going on with cars. <laughs> That's right. You know, Sonny, I used to. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Being a top technician takes a lot of hard work, and you can't do it alone. I believe you would agree vehicle technologies, repair procedures, and diagnostics are changing every year. That's where Federal Mogul Motor Parts' Guru Garage can help. The Garage Guru's program has been designed by and for technicians and offers the most comprehensive program of support tools in the industry. There's a nationwide network of Guru on-site training and technology centers where you can get hands-on training with the equipment and tools needed to solve real work-related challenges. And when you can't make it to on-site training, there's Gurus Online, a 24-7 online academy with a huge catalog of course options. Garage Gurus also helps where it matters most, on the job, in your shop. Their Gurus On The Go technology fleet, well, they bring the latest products and technology demos right to you. If you need a quick part lookup, the Gurus On Demand app gives you fast, easy, and accurate info. And when you need help with a technical issue, their bilingual ASE-certified gurus on call are ready to help. And this year, they're introducing their Garage Rewards Loyalty Program, which gets you points towards free gear from your favorite Federal Mogul Motor Parts brands. It costs nothing to join, and you could start earning points immediately. So head on over to fmgaragegurus.com, learn all about the Garage Gurus Program, and start earning points today. So, um, what wakes you up from a dead sleep at 2 o'clock in the morning? Well, what used to wake me up from a dead sleep is that car I couldn't fix when I was 23 years old or something like that. Um, I I learned <clears throat> maybe in my 30s that I should not take these problems home with me. That's not my car. I didn't build it. I didn't break it. I don't drive it, but I'm there to you know help the customers. So, that, that doesn't do it too much. Um, usually... I would say employees that's as a business owner, I think, you know, employees is the hardest part, the personalities, um, people, you know, I have a group, good group of guys, but along the way, you know, in today's society, there's not as much loyalty. You don't see, you know, where someone goes to work for a business and they retire from that business and get pension from that business. You know, it's, you know, it's, hey, let me go work here. Oh, there's a better deal across the street. I'm going to move there and move there and move there. So um, I think employees would be the biggest one. I try and keep happy and make sure they're on a straight path. What do you do to recharge yourself? Got any hobbies? I love sailing. Um, I love hiking. I love traveling. Um, I love, you know, this is a big world. And I'm not that guy who goes to the same spot for two weeks in the summer, every year for 20 years in a row. Um, I don't even hardly want to go to the same spot twice. So we always want to see new places, visit um, Europe, uh, Central America, see more of North America. Um, I have a five-year-old, love taking him outside, hiking in the woods. So, Excellent. Uh, You have a five-year-old at 43. 45. At 45, a five-year-old. I think you and I share very similar. Um, I was, uh, I had a five year old when I was right about that age too. So very, and, and you know what? That'll keep you very, very young at heart. 
That's right. That's right. 40 was the 30, you know, five yeah, years ago. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 60 is the new 50. Are you kidding me? That's right. <laughs> I'll never forget my son saying, Dad, Dad, 30 is the new 20. <laughs> <laughs> I love uh, it. Amazing stuff. Amazing. Any good habits that you have as an entrepreneur that you'd love to share? Um, consistency, embracing technology, I'm always on time. I guess the base one for, I always tell my service advisor, um, under promise and over deliver. So um, we don't want to say, hey, that car is going to be ready at two o'clock when you think that part's going to be there at one thirty because that part's delivery driver might not show up until 3.30. So that's a good habit to keep. Excellent. Do you ever sit down with your supplier and have a meeting about your needs? Usually to beat them up on price, but uh, <laughs> I think any good shop owner does that a little bit. Yeah, I guess the last time we did that is when we changed from, well, to go back a little bit, you know, this industry had a three-month, 3,000-mile warranty for a very long time. And so when I went to the industry, I changed that almost immediately to 12 and 12. So this was back in, you know, the early 90s. But you were self-insuring. Yes. And so customers can remember three months quite easily. They couldn't remember 12 months as easily. Um, and I figured if I fixed a car and it didn't last three months, there's a problem. We went 12 and 12. Just five years after that, maybe we went 24, 24. Now we're 36, 36. And so when we went 36, 36, I called every single supplier and I said, you know, I know we're at 24, 24 with you now. Um, I'm going to 36, 36. Will you support me with this? And every single one of them, except dealerships, said yes. Um, they actually um, changed I guess, their warranty for me um, and support me with that. So, Any big threat or concern to your business? Um, they did some road construction in front of me and actually turned my, my little community into a historic district. So, yeah, some three bays I've been thinking about adding on. Um, oh, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What do you mean you're going to change your building? You're in a historic district. I know. I was thinking about adding a bay. Oh. Um, but, you know, I'm torn with that because I really like the size I'm at. And, you know, yeah, you can get bigger and bigger. I've owned two shops in the past. And so I really like running one shop really well and being able to be that five-day-a-week, you know, employer and shop owner. And uh, if you can't do it in five days – you know, six isn't going to help you too much. So if I had that bay, you know, that just adds more stress and more people and more this and more that. But, you know, in a historic district, I think they don't really want an automotive repair shop. So they probably say no anyway. So maybe that's a blessing. Can you notice it a significant change in you as a leader over the last 22 years? The older I get, the more patient I get. So yeah. and I'm not, I'm not, uber patient now, but you should have seen me 20 years ago. So patience, I think, is the biggest change in my personal life and with business. Are you more of a democracy than you were then? Uh, slightly, probably 10% more. <laughs> so you don't give anybody a vote? Yeah, they get a vote, but, uh, you know, the, the uh, buck stops with me, you know, based on you know, more than what maybe they think. I, I'm looking at the big picture. I'm looking at how it affects customers, the business, marketing, um, everything more than just, you know, that one opinion. From your website, it says, we are genuinely passionate about people, community, and cars. It says, by taking the confusion and mystery out of auto repair, we gain trust and bring respect to our industry. We want people to ask questions, tell us, or just stop by and say hello. If the car needs an expert, let us prove that our automotive repair can be a fantastic and phenomenal experience. Taking our automotive repair business to another level involves caring, trust, and devotion to you, the customer, and our Virginia Beach community. Wow. I mean, it's like right there. It's almost like your purpose. Uh, for sure. That that was our mission statement, and um, we truly believe that. Uh, 
you know, I always say if I can spend as little time talking about cars to people, um, I'll do just fine because I really like hearing what's going on in their life. Um, you know, we're definitely seeing multiple generations um, of our customers, which is a lot of fun. That's excellent. Yeah, we're we're helping them when the kids have to drive off to Virginia Tech, you know, which is six plus hours away. Um, we want to make sure that kid has uh, our business card in their glove box so that if they have any problems whatsoever, um, maybe they're going to pick up the phone and call us first if it has to do with their vehicle so we can help them. Um, we've actually encouraged them that if they have any questions with any repair shops where they're at, you know, at college that, you know, the repair shop can call us and we can talk to them and tell them what we've done to the car and the service history um, to build that bond. You're so into customers. Give me your best customer service story. You know, everybody has these because, you know, you always have your core customers. Um, well, I'll tell you one that happened two days ago. We have a customer, you know, we pick and choose which older cars we work on. He owns a 66 Mustang. So um, from a business point of view, you really have to, uh, you know, balance uh, modern and older cars because older cars will you know, eat your lunch sometimes with the amount of time it takes to repair them. And the, we have an ice cream truck that comes up every Tuesday. And I really wish the guy would go away because he's not doing any service to my waistline every Tuesday. But <laughs> so the, the customer was there with this Mustang and I went and got him and I called him out to the ice cream truck and I'm like, Hey, what do you want? And I bought him an ice cream um, and, and he just loved that. He just sat there and talked with me and ate the ice cream. And, and that was the best, I think two or $3 I ever spent. Cause he will remember that ice cream, I think for the next six months. Great story. Tell me about family service day. Uh, we just started partnering with them. Um, I'm super excited. We, we really want to do a good job with them and gear up for this. And so we're starting to talk to partners about this and, and the way it works is you pick a day and sometimes twice a year where your staff volunteers and you get maybe a couple service partners, um, maybe, you know, like an insurance company, your bank, uh, uh, auto parts supplier, something like that to help donate some money. Um, and you make an event, you know, maybe you have someone do balloon animals or something like that. And you are bringing in uh, usually – like single mothers or uh, families that are in need of auto repair that can't afford it. And you're actually taking a Saturday and, you know, getting their car, you know, in not tip top shape, but making it safer. So, you know, maybe you have to, you know, fix a few things or here, change the oil, um, just make it more reliable, make it so, you know, they can get up every, they start the vehicle and get that kid to school or to the doctor's appointment or you know, just make their life better. We interviewed Suzanne Hawley, their executive director, in episode 120. And I encourage everyone to go out and listen to Suzanne. She talks about how they started and all the, all the great programs. So uh, thanks for uh, validating. Yeah, she, she's great. Um, I s met her and Charlie in person at the first annual Ratchet and Wrench, Wrench Conference in Chicago. Hey, how was that, by the way? Yeah, that was great. For the first one out of the gate, they did a really nice job. They're just a really great group of people um, that work for Ratchet and Wrench, and I enjoy talking with all of them. And they, I think when it comes to that, uh, content is key, and Ratchet and Wrench just has some really good content. Boy, you are right about content. I'm in the content business, and, and you're helping deliver right now. Oh, awesome. Thank you, man. Hey, uh, give me an industry problem and a way that you think you would solve it. Tech shortages. When I was in school, you know, they said you couldn't get a job unless you went to college. So if they beat that drum, you know, for 20 or 30 years, so all of a sudden you don't have – young people that think they should uh, go into the automotive industry. You know, the world needs automotive technicians. The world needs plumbers. The world needs electricians. And, um, and we need qualified 
you know, people to, in those industries. And not everyone is built for college and made for college. So um, I think to keep technicians, to, to keep them happy, keep them loyal, you got to pay them good. You have to have health insurance. You have to have benefits. You have to care. It's a relationship there, just like it's a relationship with customers. Automotive science or automotive service? A little bit of both, I think. Good answer. Thank you. Uh, must attend conferences. You mentioned vision. Anything else? I think when you said earlier on the podcast that play is an important word, um, I agree because each year I go to SEMA and Apex. I think 10%, you know, is me going and looking at equipment and and maybe striking a deal on something, talking to Hunter or something like that. And, you know, they usually have some deals at Apex. Um, but maybe 90% of it's play and just looking at the awesomeness that's out there. And if, if you own a shop, usually you like tools, you like cars, you like trucks, you like, you know, fun stuff like that. So. What's the shop of the future going to look like? Well, my shop was built in the 60s. And uh, so um, I think I've done really – good at keeping it, you know, current and making it, you know, look nice still and not, you know, look shabby and beat down. Um, the shop of the future, I think you really have to balance the beautification, the size, you know, I've seen these shops that have ginormous um, waiting areas and stuff like that. And that's all fine and dandy. As long as you can, you know, keep costs under control and and watch that bottom end and hold those margins um, because it can come at a price if you overbuild. So, Got it. Looking back, Eric, what are you the proudest of? Probably running a successful business from such an early age. Um, I was the youngest Amico dealer in the country um, at age 22. And so when I went to Amico school um, – They all thought my father owned the shop and my father's a mechanical engineer who works on submarines. He definitely does not, you know, run an automotive repair shop. And so uh, I had to uh, deal with a lot of customers that were looking past me, looking for someone else as the owner when I was in my 20s because I looked so young. And to be able to work with that and still come out on top, I think, is my largest success. Well, wow, that's uh, that's a great story. I like that. Uh, you must not be the owner. You're just one of the, yeah. you're just one of the kids that's hanging out here. <laughs> I heard that about a million times. Oh boy! Hey, well, hey, Eric, Eric Speedberg from Automotive Specialists. Thanks for sharing your wisdom, your stories. One last request: Can you share with us words of wisdom that you live by every day? Honesty. Um... This is an industry that has had its problems with, you know, some dishonest shops, dishonest technicians, dishonest owners. And, you know, I have found over and over again, if you are honest and just tell the customer um, what's going on, you you come out on top every single time. It might not be what they want to hear, but you're going to come out on top and they'll respect you for it. Hey, man, thanks for sharing your remarkable results. Carm, this has been great. Thank you, man. Thank you. Hey, Aftermarketers, thanks for joining us. There's more on Eric Svedberg on the episode's page at remarkableresults.biz slash E167. Hey, I'm very interested in your ideas, insights, or comments. Just email me at carm at remarkableresults.biz or head over to the contact page on the website. Hey, thank you for helping spread the word on the Aftermarket's premier podcast that delivers powerful insights and stories for you. Entrepreneurs, technicians, distributors, manufacturers, students, and educators are among the many industry professionals that listen each week. And please pay it forward. As I said in the intro, find a baby boomer and show them how to listen. Many do not know what a podcast is. Only 57 million people a month listen or download podcasts. Hey, get them up to speed and thanks. So keep sharing the wisdom with your friends and peers. Until the next time. Thanks for being on board to listen and learn from another inspiring aftermarket professional. Until next time.